this place around the world makes life worth living is not the achievements of time but eternity that really matters with a life I'm so grateful to be here I come in this morning it's like coming home always meet the folks up and down these aisles and year after year we've been coming didn't think we'd ever make it back to this year but here we are 2008 probably won't make it till next year but if we do we'll have gone a little further for Christ this has been a very busy difficult but I think one of the most productive years of my life out there in that world of missions of Islam Buddhism and every other kind of ism it's been it's been beyond words to explain all that's happened some of the most tremendous miracles ever to happen to a human happened and it's just wonderful to be back here you know when I was 14 I thought I'd never get to be 20 and if you would have asked me when I was 14 years and two months how old it was that I'm going on 15 when I got to 30 I thought well it would be good not to have birthdays forget them but oh today I'm so glad to see them <laughs> you're really glad to see a birthday when you get along where I am today I, I prayed much about <clears throat> the beginning you know I, I've been a preacher long enough to know that the beginning and the last is the thing that makes in between you may stumble a little but if you recover at the end you've made it but if you fail at the beginning it's hard to recover you know I, and the only thing I'm talking about failing not how I present it but the message that I believe that God would have us to begin I believe it's a crucial year pastor and I and uh, uh, others we uh, preached till about 10 o'clock last night talked about God the things of God and brother Casey and his dear wife we just rolling over what has been what looks like it's going to be I believe this year is a very crucial year for the church in spite of the most difficult days maybe a world ever faced just ahead of us Yet I do believe it's the greatest moment in history for the real church of the living God. I, I just believe that, not from just what I feel, but what I have witnessed of a people. A people are looking for reality today. They've, they've saw the sham. They've, been, they've had the governments to fail. We watch a reprobate mind come to govern our own country today that believes good is evil and evil is good uh, come to a place in time that we promote that which God said had to die uh, we just live in such a time but there must needs be darkness if light's going to shine there must needs be error if truth is really going to blossom and I certainly believe that we are there today and I my message I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 <clears throat> and the message worldliness a deadly disease I felt very strongly that this was the way I should begin this and I believe that God has something to say to all of us that are in this place this morning father thank you as we turn and read the word of God this morning will you anoint us to speak and hear not just to say words, but to hear what you have to say to our hearts. Let us be open here this morning that you want to talk to us. I believe you want a meeting with your church in this hour because the key to all that you're going to do is a church that's in line with you. God bless the preaching and hearing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You know, a great Christian, holy man, I don't know just when he lived, but I've read much of him. His name was Andrew Bonar. He made this statement, he said, I looked for the church and I found it in the world. 
I looked for the world and I found it in the church. If that was true then, how true that is in the hour in which we live. The 21st century Pentecostal church are filled with believers who have forsaken the Lord and have given themselves over to the joy and the pleasures of the time. Now, it'll take God to convince them of that because it's so easily to be deceived what we are. We can lie to ourselves and believe it much easier than it is for somebody else to lie to us. If we tell ourselves the things, it's awfully easy to believe it. We speak of things that are right, things that are wrong in the context of our own thinking and own believing. These people profess to serve the Lord and yet they've allowed the world to dim their spiritual eyesight. They no longer see as God sees. They have come to look at what God wants out of their own eyes. We've become. It's a wonderful thought to know that a person that walks with God can see both ways. You and I are citizens of both a visible and an invisible world. We, we have to deal with it in that direction. And if we're not able to see things as God sees them, then we're sure to be deceived. Worldliness robs a Christian of the vital radiant character. Once that world has come in and begun to influence that life, then that character has lost its ability to evoke the response that they took knowledge you have been with the Christ. Worldliness is anything that takes a keen edge off of my spiritual life and dims my vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what it is. It isn't a matter of just dress, it isn't a matter of talk, it's a matter of what I am. This is the key to understanding that worldliness is a deadly disease because it is exactly what I am. It's anything that robs me of a deep, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever there is in my life, be it wife, house, children, or land, that affects my relationship with that Christ is a worldly spirit. It's a spirit that robs me of the ability to be and to do what God wants me to be and to do. Worldliness is anything that takes away the burden for souls in this world. And I can promise you the 21st century Pentecostal church as a whole is not concerned about anything but itself. Its own creature comfort is not concerned about a world out there, 2,000 million, that never, never heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that individual or that church that isn't a missionary-minded individual or church has not the mind of Christ. The last words of Christ had to do with us going into all the world, preach this gospel to every creature. And we must ever remind ourselves that that commission was given in a Pentecostal context and can only be carried out by a Pentecostal church in Pentecostal power. That, that's the commission that God gave and it was to such people that God gave it. Worldliness is anything that hinders my spending time in earnest intercession by the Spirit for the church and the world. Whatever keeps me from that is a worldly spirit. <clears throat> We've defined worldliness by a lot of things. It's like, you know, Lent. When it comes with the Catholic Church, I think that they're fast in something. Well, a, one person told me, I don't know how it fits with all, said I fast chocolate. I don't like it anyway. Well, that's pretty well the way it's come uh, with us. We pick, we choose how that we want our life to live. Now, worldliness is anything. Life has become very fast for people who call themselves Christians. We're moving. Christians are giving themselves, uh, are not rather giving themselves to God. <clears throat> they give themselves to their jobs, their desires, their wants, their wills. Their whole life is spent in making sure that everything is good now and when they retire will be good then. It's not a concern 
For, for a world without God is not a concern about their spiritual life nearly so much as it is of what they have here. Much of today's theology has brought us to that very place. As a Christian, we're citizens of two worlds, the visible, the invisible, and that visible is so close. Driving down that freeway, signs half as big as the wall behind me, television, radio, everything screaming at me, creating an appetite for the goods of this world. It's a visible world. It's so close, and it's so easily to allow that thing to involve us. Amen. The world creates an appetite for its wares, and Christians are not accept, not, 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 not out of it. The world, the visible, screams to us, find your passion, find your purpose, give yourself to that. That's a cry of this world. You'll find it from the pulpit. A better self-image. Everything, everywhere, there is that cry to us for something that involves us in, in, in this time of now. So what is this thing called worldliness? We, we have to know. Not a matter of just looking at what holiness people have called it. Uh, you know, I, I deal with a group of holiness churches. I lost favor with them. I said, I've been around you all of my life. I was born in this. I said, here you're holiness. You've got a set of rules that once were real conviction, but they become rules of religion. You hate about everybody that doesn't look like you look, but you wouldn't give a quarter to missions. There's nothing to your holiness if you don't do what God tells you. There's nothing to your faith unless you obey and do what you're told. It's a facade. It's a fraudulent thing to claim to be holy and live in disobedience to what you know to be be the will of God. There is no holiness to that. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Now, if I'd said this, it means nothing. But if God says it, I love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in that man. Now, it's imperative then that I know what this world is. Because God said, not me, I didn't hear it from a preacher, I read it from the Word of God, that if I love this world, then the love of God is not in me. Now, I must know, if the love of God's not in me, I'm not a Christian. That's as sure as you said in this building this morning. Now, these verses demand that we examine and consider wellness. We cannot escape the issue. It's a matter of life and death, not just a matter of being cute to preach something. Now, in these verses, we find the answer to very three to three very important questions. Number one: What do you love? That number one, the important. What do you love? That says everything about you. What what really is a driving force of your life? What captures your affections? We find the answer. Number two, what is the true object of your love? What is it that it focuses itself upon? You, 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 you can understand, I believe, before I get through exactly what I'm saying. And where is that love taking you? Those three things. Now, what do you love? 1 John 2.15 confronts us with two commands. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. Now, that immediately brings us into contact with what the world is from God's standpoint. We made it one thing. I talked to a man. He said he hadn't sinned in 25 years. He, he said, I wish I knew what I know now. Uh, in, uh, knew all my life what I know now. And he went on talking about he had been sanctified uh, where, where that he couldn't sin. I said to him, if you let me set the perimeters of sin, then I'm perfect. But if you let this book set it, then you nor me are perfect. No matter what you think, you let this book. There's much that God calls sin that we've come to accept as a normal part of a Christian life. This thing called self is so subtle.
that you can be influenced, governed by it, never realize, all the while from what you hear in the pulpit a lot of time, make you believe that this is all a part of the gospel. Now John is not talking about people when he talks about the world. God so loved that world of people. But he's talking about a system that's totally opposed to God. If you want to know the will of God, then just look where Washington is trying to lead you. That's the opposite. Just the opposite direction the rulers of this world are trying to take it. Now John speaks in the present tense that we are to stop loving the world, do not love the world, don't set your heart upon things of this world. If God gives you things, they must never be a possession. God doesn't care what you have so much, but He sure cares what has you. All along this line, what governs you? The things that make it. Could you go back to a bicycle if you had to? Could you live where you have lived? What is all of it? Would it disturb your relationship with God if all the creature comfort you had lost in the morning? When I was seven years old, men went to bed one night with a hundred thousand dollar home. They woke up the next morning, it was worth ten thousand. People were throwing banks were locked for three years, had any money in it, you couldn't get it. The whole world changed. Would you love God if that happened tonight? Where is your affection set? What are we set upon? Is it that new car and the smell of it? Or is it walking with God in the peace and the joy and the righteousness of God? The, simply speaking, this means that God will not tolerate any rivals for his affections. It doesn't matter who they are. If you love that wife more than me, you're not worthy of me. But I've learned that if I love God more than I love that woman, I can love that woman more than I could ever have loved her otherwise. When I put God first in my life, then everything in my life is enlarged. That's the truth I've discovered in 58 years of walking with this great God. The question must be asked and answered by every Christian and every one of us in this room. What are the things in your life that are in competition with the love of God? What are there? You and I. If we're going to be a part of what God's doing, and if we're going to be a part of that bridal company, that must be considered seriously. If you will be honest, you will find, every one of us, that there's some things in this life that are in competition with the love of God. There are things in that life. Now, when we honestly begin to look, we must remember the counsel of the Lord to the lukewarm. If you can't find anything, in that life is because they've deceived you and made you believe they're part of what God wants in your life. You love those things because they're from God. But they're not God. You understand? You can, you, it's the greatest crime of a preacher and the easiest way to lose his life is to make that man believe that his working for God is the same thing as worshiping that God. I, I learned that. The people that work in that office. I said, we're not going to start work at 8. We're going to start at 7. You'll be paid part, but we will spend the first hour in prayer. You'll be there with me, or you won't work in this office. The day you forget this is a ministry, you don't belong in this place no more. You don't need to handle that which is of God just to make yourself a living. Whether it's cleaning these floors or whatever else you are doing, it must be. And you working in this office doesn't constitute a relationship with God, but you ought to have a relation before I let you in this office. There has to be that personal intimacy with God. Amen. And whatever took that away is a loving of something more than you love God. Now when we honestly look inward, we must remember Revelation 3.17. Because thou say, I'm rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, don't you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Now, we're commanded to examine ourselves. Paul said to the Corinthian church, examine yourself, whether or not you be in the faith. He said, don't you know if Christ is not in you, you're a reprobate. No matter how faithful you are to the church, how much you labor, how many Sunday school lessons you teach, 
How many songs you sing in this choir, if Christ is not in you personally, living, Christ in you is the only hope of glory, and if He's not there, then your singing this choir becomes a worldly thing because it's something you want to do and it isn't something to glorify the great God. Whenever, whatever I'm doing is not for that purpose, then it's for my own purpose, for my own desire. I do that because that is what I want to do. Now, to prove, listen, he said prove whether you whether it's Christ in you. Now, the word prove, according to Mr. Strong here, means to be, uh, is not to be deceived about ourselves. Not to be deceived. To prove yourself is to have a look. Don't be deceived about what you are. You, being a preacher don't make you holy. Being a bishop don't make you holy. The church has been led into the wilderness every time by preachers, bishops, prelates, popes. Amen. The sheep didn't lead them there. It's men that decided that that office made them something. That office makes you nothing. Amen. It's God's Christ that makes us something. And when we forget that, then preaching becomes as worldly as a bar stool. Amen. When it's only a living that you're trying to make, then you're a worldly man. I've dealt with them. They preach a sermon like the man that laid this carpet. I don't have to do this again on next Sunday. That's 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 an attitude. Did you wonder? New York, when 9-11 come, churches filled everywhere. People with divorce were coming back together. But after a few months, they're all back out in the world. Well, the world said, and the church said, well, that's the way it is. When in danger, they go looking for God. But that's not what it was. A detective in New York, who's my very good friend, when I preach up there, they put him in charge of me. He said, Pastor, that's not the way it was. They went to that church after 9-11. He'd have nothing to say to them. They found no answers. They found business as usual. Why waste your time with religion if there's not an answer to life? Why should I go to a church and listen to somebody argue and go over and debate about religion when it doesn't affect my life? Any message I ever hear that doesn't cause a desire in me to be a more holy person is a doctrine of a devil. It's not just Mormonism. It is any message preached that doesn't stir this heart to move closer to God is a doctrine of a devil. Make no mistake about it. Now listen to the words that come out of your mouth. What, what, listen here, look at, uh, to prove means, means to uh, know yourself. How do you prove? Well, look at what you do with your time. Look at what you do with your time. You say you don't have no time to pray, but you listen to that television five hours yesterday. You sit there and listen to people that hate everything that we are. You sit there and watch that, or you watch a ball game for hours. What do you do with your time? That'll tell you more about yourself than anything else. Do you have time? Do you only pray when the preacher says prayer? I can tell you God dealt with me. He said, I don't need preachers calling prayer meeting here as much as I need people that'll pray. Well, that preacher calls me not. I'm going to be in that altar. Amen. I've got children lost. I've got grandkids lost. I've got a world out there going to hell. I don't have to have somebody to call me to preach. If I do, I'd have to tell him, he'd have to tell me what to say when I got there. It must come out of a burden of a heart. There must come. What do you do with your time? How do you prove yourself? How do you do with your time? Look at what you're most passionate about. I was, I was listening to a preacher talking about uh, a ball game, and he'd watched it, it, had, it, the thing run for about five hours, it was a tie game, it went on about five hours. I knew him very well, very close with him, uh, around, and I've watched him, I've preached, called an altar, ten minutes he's up, run around shaking hands with people. He can sit there five or six hours, and what's the gladiators of this 20th century and can't spend an hour on his knees? He's as worldly as any man ever was on a bar stool. There's a facade, let me tell you, I'm not being mean, I'm just telling you that the world has come into our church and made us believe things that are not right. If God is going to have my affections, He's going to have all of them. He doesn't share me with anybody. This is a totalitarian king, kingdom, and church. He brooks no disobedience. He says, you 
were born again to be possessed of me and if you'll not allow that to happen then you're going to be possessed by something else she know all of California knows a lot about demon possessed people but it knows so little about God possessed people that's why we were born. Where does your money go? I'm talking about how do you examine yourself? What do you give yourself to? We're examining, proving ourselves whether we'll be in the faith. We said, look at where your time goes. Look at what you're most passionate about. What do you give yourself to? Now, there are there things more important to you than prayer and the Word of God. Are they? Don't matter who you are. If you belong to God, are they things in your life that are more important than prayer and the Word of God? That, that's the only way that I can examine myself by asking these questions and being honest. <clears throat> Where does your money go? Are you more concerned about your future here than the spreading of the kingdom of God? Are you more concerned uh, uh, about a retirement someday than you are people here in the gospel? Listen to the words that come out of your mouth. We can know ourselves by what comes out of our mouth. As a, as a mouth speaketh. Amen. That You're talking what you are. You understand? Those thoughts, those words, those things that come. And if we'll listen to our own conversation, we'll surely come to know what we are. We'll know about our life. What do we talk about? Amen. You sit down, some people want to talk about a golf game. They want to talk about a football game. They want to talk about this. But I can tell you where that mind goes when you lay it down at night. Where does it go? What does it tend to? What do you think about? What do you think about most? What is the most important thing of your life? I'm talking about worldliness that the Bible said robs us of everything. The Bible said out of the abundance of the heart that mouth speaks. It speaks what you are. Now, the honest heart is a heart of a hearer who's come to this house of God this morning for one thing, to hear what God has to say to him or her. That's an honest heart. He has no other reason to come. I come here. You come here if you're honest to God. You come here to hear what God has to say to you. Amen. What is God? Does God have a word for me in my life? That's the honest heart. Now his eye is single and the house is full of light. The pure in heart will see God in this building this morning. There's some folks want to see a cockroach somewhere or a cobweb in the corner that's a janitor myth because that's what they come for. But that man who is focused, that woman who is focused, they will see God in this house. Amen. He hears words that he intends to keep tomorrow. That honest heart in this house this morning hears words that he intends to keep tomorrow, to lay them in his heart and to practice them in his life. That's the honest man. He is an honest man and God will deal honestly with that human being. Male or female, God will deal. But there are others in this building this morning. I'm not a prophet. I'm just telling you, I've been here long enough to know that every preacher has two congregations, the dead and the living. They are there. Make no mistake about it. They're in that house. There are others in the same house, hearers of the same words, but hearts that are not honest. They're not honest. They're in God's house, but they're not here to meet with God or understand and lay up and keep the word of God. That's not the reason they're here this morning. They, they've come to see or to be seen. They come here because this is the thing men ought to do. We ought to go to church. These people say, well, I believe everybody ought to go to church. Well, I didn't answer that ought to be. Amen. Everybody that knows and loves this God, they're here because they want to hear from God. They're not here because this is what ought to be. That man will never know what's said when he leaves here anyway. He'll know nothing that's said. You ask him out there, how'd the preaching go? Well, it seemed like it's good. What did he say? Don't remember. Well, he just heard it ten minutes to go, but that wasn't what they were here for. You understand? I'm talking about world and this what is it? They, 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 they're here, amen, they're here not, not to hear what God says, amen, they're here because they like the music. 
because they believe and that's something they should do. They're here because of some spiritual program or some big name preacher. I mean, not here this morning in this particular place, but all over this country, it's that way. There are those in that house, there are those in that house because they want to hear what God has to say. There are others there because they like the music, they like this, they like that. That's not an honest heart. This is the house of God. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And if I'm here for any other reason than to leave here knowing what God wants out of me, I've come for the wrong reason. I've come. There's a selfishness involved. What do we care about? That's the next thing. What do we care about? Amen. We all face temptation when we think too much about what other people think about us. When you care, I, I care what God thinks. And if I'm right with God, then I don't care what you think. I mean, I want to uh, be right. I want to be, but I'm saying I'm not going to change what I am just because you don't like it. If I know that I'm walking with God, that I know He's ple pleased with my life. Now, what, what we should care about instead of what others think is that are you and I presenting a corporate witness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do men actually, because we're here, know that we've been with Christ and know that Christ is alive? Are we presenting that guy? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Any man, that's you and I, men and women in this place. So man, the word man is generic in the way I'm using it. Male and female. And it's talking to you and I. No human born of a woman excluded. The epistle was written to saints. People that claim to know God. This is true or it's not true. If we do not love the world, then this is not true of us. But if we do, it is. This is very important to all here in this message. Because if any of us indeed love the world, then the Bible said the love of the Father is not in you. If that's a Clinton statement, it means nothing. But if that's the Holy Ghost, and there's a love of this world in you, God said the love of God is not in your life. Now, it's as clear as it can be. I mean, the love of God. Oh, I have found that. But unconsciously that's there that's the reading God says examine you know many of us we don't know what world in this is sometimes and unconsciously that is there but when God uncovers now it's not unconscious it becomes willful in the life that we don't attempt to straighten it up now, I'm well aware that this is not what the average Pentecostal Christian so-called wants to hear but but this is, thus saith God. It was God who said, do not love the world. Therefore, as sheep of his pasture, we cannot argue or ignore this. I've got to know what that world is. I woke up one night and I heard this voice. It said to me, they went everywhere preaching Christ. For the next two years, I looked at Christ like I've never looked at him in my life. Amen. I've never. If I'm going to preach him, I've got to know more than he just died. I've got to know who he is. If the knowledge of Christ is the answer to all things spiritual, physical, and everything, uh, then I must know what that knowledge is. And if there's a love of this world in me, I've got to know that because God said when it becomes willful, then the love of God is not there. When it comes to that, when I allow that, I, I'm talking to us this morning. I believe we're the final generation, folks. There's got to be an examination of life. It's not business as usual or church as usual. It was God who said, do not love the world. The foolish virgin, something, that in their lives there was something more important than spiritual renewal. You know, Hosea said, uh, talking, God talking to Hosea, his house was in disarray. We are that house. It was a building made of stone then. But that house, the windows were broken. The, the roof needed fixing. He said, you say the time has not come. You, I've told you to build that out. You live in sealed houses. called Mr. Strong and the commentary uh, of, of some of them. It said they had a thin layer of gold on the ceiling of their house. He said, you say the time has not come. They never said the house doesn't need repair. They never said we don't not going to do it. What they said was going to do it in our own time. 
those virgins never said, never one time said we don't need oil. They knew they didn't need oil because the first thing that happened, they said our lamp's gone out. The first thing. They never said that the preacher's wrong, we don't need it. They just said tonight we've got an appointment at the Burger King or somewhere else. That's Sunday night. We'll take care of this Wednesday, but Wednesday never came. They never made that raptured church simply because they had some things more important. God deal with your heart this morning. You can walk out of here. You don't have to pay any mind to it. I can tell you, you may not get very far until you realize how much it meant. My friend Deb now, Brother Hibbert, preaching on the streets of Dallas, Texas, and a small daily policeman come, ribbing up that motorcycle, finally said to the preacher, how far is it to hell? He said, just around the corner. Twenty seconds later, he was dead. Run over by an 18-wheeler. You can play with God if you like. But if it deals with the heart, don't put it off. They may not be it tomorrow. Today, if you hear that voice, harden not their heart for God's sake. If there's something in that life, be priest or preacher, saint or whatever, it's time to deal with it. It's time to have a look at it. I'm trying to be very specific. Amen. The time has not come, they said. God said, I'm going to blow the roof off of your house. This is God's house. This is the church. You remember in particular. And when you're out of sorts, then there's a hole in the wall of that church. And the main thing with God is to fix that church. He can't reach a world without a body, a vehicle, a vessel to pour himself through. And don't talk to me he said the only time in the Bible that I can ever say God always said about his dear people his people but here he said this people that's that, that that's a very you know God my, my father said this time that's enough I knew it's over with now he may he may let it slip once but no more when he said this people what he said these 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 people that care nothing about nothing he said I'm gonna tear your house apart those virgin knew we choose, listen, we choose what we value. Make no mistake about it. Nothing could be more plain than the fact that we cannot love God in the world at the same time. That, that's just so clear. Love not the world, neither things of the world. If you love the world, the love of God is not in you. Man will always choose one or the other because God has so made him that he can only worship one thing at a time. You can't worship money and God at the same time. That can't be your God. Your quest can't be for money and be for God. You've got to make a living. Understand what I'm telling you. But the goal of your life must be more than that. No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate one, love the other, or he'll hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. You can't serve two gods. A double-minded man, James said, is unstable in all of his way. Any attempt to worship two things at the same time will lead to a disease, fruitless, and wasted life. And every time. There'd be no, that double-minded, cross-eyed man trying to please them and please that. Amen. It won't work. We fill the church with tears because we tried to please both of them. You can't. It's either God or you hell. It's either heaven or hell. Man said, I don't have to speak in tongues. I said, of course you don't. You can go to hell if you want to. You don't have to do anything. Just do nothing. It'll take care of itself. You'll wound up in hell. That's all that's going to happen. Amen. But I'm telling you, if you want God, and we're going to walk with God, then we must hear what God is saying. And he said, if you hear and don't do, you're a foolish person. And it was that foolishness that cost those virgins a place in that rapture. They heard, and they did not, they did not do. Every man will choose what he deems to be most valuable to himself. He will. It doesn't matter what he chooses, it will be. In every choice, act, word, and thought, you show what you value and what you choose. Everything. Everything. I can tell you it's a disgraceful thing when you realize the choices it's made. I said to a preacher here some time ago, I said, if I was God and God was me, I may not let him be my steward. I've wasted so much money on things that I didn't need. I don't need ten pair of shoes or ten suits. 
while men go to hell. He said, if you got two goats, give a man one of them. But here we are. Amen. We live in like the rest of the world, had everything that we've got. I just come from Bang, uh, Cambodia. I just come from Vietnam. I don't know if ever more fruitful time in my life to what I see. Uh, amen. But I saw people with absolutely nothing, folks. Absolutely nothing. And not, and, and without God. And, and a new suit's more important to me than telling that man, that woman, that Jesus died for him. It's something radically, radically wrong. Amen. I'm glad that we have these comfortable seats. But if I won't give as much money to missions as I did to buy them comfortable seats, there's something out of twist with our lives. Amen. There's something all twisted around because all we're dealing with now is creature, creature comfort. You cannot live contrary to what you believe. I won't say anything more important than what I'm going to tell you now. You cannot live contrary to what you believe. Your, your life does not dictate to you what you believe, but what you believe dictates how you live. Ever else. Listen, a noble and godlike character is not a thing, a favor of chance. It's a natural result of a continued effort in right thinking. Amen. My thought life determines me. I make myself, I mean that right. I mean, I have the mind of Christ. I have a carnal mind. To be carnally minded is death. That's, that's, that's carte blanche. It's over with. To live in this mind is to live in death. Because everything that comes out of there is for my own. Even in preaching, I want somebody to recognize me. I want somebody to tell me I'm a good preacher. I want somebody to tell me I'm a good pastor. I, I want to be recognized. Always, whatever comes out of that mind, I have a choice. I can think and live in God's thoughts. But every act of my life is a product of a thought. I am what I think. As a man thinketh, so is that man. So the Bible said, let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. The Bible said to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life in peace. Man, man is made or unmade by himself. Hey, by himself. Now, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm talking about the new creature now. That man without him is already outside. But man is made or unmade by himself, by his thoughts. In the armory of thought, he forges the weapons by which he makes or destroys himself. As a man thinketh. Jesus said every thought brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. As I set my mind to think whatsoever things are lovely, pure. I can't help those thoughts that come to this mind. They say that just tells you the devil's thoughts fly everywhere. Nobody in this room so holy that immoral thoughts don't come to that mind. I have not sinned unless I entertain that thing. But if I entertain it, I've lost it. Amen. That, that has come. This, this is what he's saying. Man, listen. Man is buffeted by circumstances as long as, as, as he believes he's a creature of outside conditions. Oh, my. Uh, you, you're listening to me. I hope. I took a long time to get this all down. Listen. Man is a creature buffeted by circumstances so long as he believes he's a creature of outside conditions. But when he realizes as a new creation that he is a creative power and that he commands the seed and the soil out of which those circumstances grow. I create the world I live in by how I think. If my mind stayed upon God, I preach a world of perfect peace. Yes, sir. That's what God said. But if those thoughts are allowed to live out there things that are not holy, though they're not uh, unholy to speak of, they're just things. But if that's what fills my mind, I I've opened myself up to total and absolute destruction. The outer world of circumstances shapes itself to the inward world of thought. No matter. You are a product of your thinking. There's no action without thought. And how you act is because that's what you are. Amen. 
uh, you know, now uh, it, it shapes itself in the world thought, and both pleasant and unpleasant external conditions are factors which make for the ultimate goal for the individual. All things do work together for good. All things. Amen. It's our loud. Now listen, circumstances do not make the man, they just reveal what the man is. Amen. Brother Ship, my good friend, so beautifully put that in his new book. Amen. That very thing. The outbursts that come out of you. That that's not that's not spontaneous. That's just what you are. Under that strict pressure of circumstances, you blow up, you cuss, you get mad, you kick the dog, you do whatever you want to. That's just what you are. That's something coming out, not dead, that has to be dealt with. You have you have to know. Men do not attract what they want. They attract what they are. As a man thinketh, that's what he is. And that's what he attracts to himself all of the time, everywhere. Spiritual achievements are the consummation of holy desires and inspirations. That's the end of the line. I will awaken his likeness. If that's my desire, if that's a vision of my life, if that's what I think on, if all that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering governs my life, I will awake there, folks. If that fills my thought life, if I reject, I know the devil interferes, but Paul said, reckon yourself dead to those things coming, but alive unto God Almighty. And the ultimate in will be the results of that thought life being brought in and the only way that can be is a walk in the Spirit of God. That is the mind of God becoming my mind. Amen. Listen, a spiritual achievement of the consummation, the man who continually lives in the conception of a holy and noble thinking will become wise and noble in character and rise up to a position of influence in the world he lives in. Your vision is a promise of what you'll be one day. Yes, sir. Your vision. If you can see yourself in that image and you set yourself to think that and live it, that's where you'll be. Amen. Just as sure, let me tell you, uh, you your, your, your ideal is a prophecy of what you'll be and will unveil of your life in the end. Amen. Just as sure as you sat in this house this morning. If your theology is wrong, if what you believe is not the Word of God, you're going to live contrary to the Word of God, no matter how noble you may make yourself. Amen. The curse of worldliness has invaded the church, and there must be a voice raised against that. There has to be a voice raised against it. Not just don't wear no necktie. I wish we didn't, but we do. And it's not a sin. Don't grow a beard. Grow a beard if you want to. They, were, they, they wouldn't come back. There was shame till the beard grew out in the Bible. That's all foolishness. See, women not to wear shoes without toes. Amen. Well, if a man lusts after your toes, something bad wrong with that human. Amen. I mean, this, this is the kind of foolishness that comes in when you move away from what I'm talking about. Amen. I know. I grew up in a different Pentecostal world. Amen. They, they had ideals uh, today uh, that, 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 that needed to be rearranged. But they were honest as tomorrow. They were as honest as tomorrow. And I'm not discounting that. But I am telling you, what is real of God must be real in me. But it can never be until it's in my thinking. The thoughts that I think is my prophecy of my tomorrow. I mean, how am I thinking it's going today? It's what I will wake up one day to be. As sure as you sit in this building this morning, the curse of worldliness has come. We cannot be silent. Amen. It's a matter of life or death. Worldliness robs the church of purity and power and places her in a position where she cannot and will not be the bride of Christ. He will not marry a harlot. Amen. And that which is an enemy of God will not be tolerated. Worldliness places the church in a position where she cannot proclaim the whole counsel of God. In the study of church history, we find the church never had as much influence over a world except at the time when it had nothing to do with that world. We're not here to talk to a world. Well, I mean, we're not here to discuss things with the world. We're here to talk to them. Tell them what it's all. No time for argument. No room for your word in this world. I'm just telling you, an enemy of God. That's all it is. To sit down and discuss with it is wrong. In the study of church history, we find that. Now, the end time has come. Satan is employing every possible means to crowd the Lord out of the lives of his saints. 
promoting psychology, psychological preachers. It's the whole message is psychology. See them on the face of every major magazine. All hell wants to do is make you believe that's a church. Just go to listen to a Dr. Phil message on a Sunday morning for an hour and everything's all right. If he can make the world believe that's a church, he's won already. I said he's won already. Everything is geared to that direction. We would never allow, listen, none of us would allow naked men, women to invade our home, pray to itself before our wives and children. My father would never have done that. You, you, you know, woman come to that house half dressed. Well, time, you know, a man come and go to cussing four or seven children. When he picked himself up, he'd get on outside that house. It never would be loud. None of us in this room would allow half naked men and women. We'd not allow men and women cussing, using God's name in vain, promoting divorce and homosexuality in our house. Yet the thing pours in by television, and you wonder why hell has got in the church itself. You are the church. And if you can be entertained by homosexuality or promoting of it or by downplaying marriage, then I can tell you, you're worldly as a man on a bar stool. Amen. That, there's something wrong. That doesn't entertain, amen, the right people. The vast majority of Pentecostal lot. If Andrew Bonar, who lived, I think, nearly a century ago, I'm not sure, looked for the church and found the world, looked for the world, found the church, what would he find in this 21st century? We can understand how revivals come among the Methodists in Britain when they sing the song of conviction. This one song went like this. Charles West the road he said vain delusive world I do with all creature good only Jesus I pursue who bought me with his blood all thy pleasure I forgo I trample on my wrath and pride only Jesus would I know and Jesus crucified no wonder they had a revival no wonder listen the worldless dims the vision of saints caused them to lose the sense of eternal values they become eccentric in the sight of God. They forget that they've been purchased to be possessed. That, you know, I live my life like I want. I go to church Sunday morning. What else do you want? I, I want you. I bought you with a price. You are not your own, says God to every one of us in this room this morning. No longer. They no longer live as aliens on this planet. Amen. Because of the spirit of worldliness, there's very little sacrifice in the average Christian's life. 23 ministries he's talking about around this world, touching literally thousands, maybe millions of people. And God is saying to us, make it possible. Keep it going. Enlarge the borders. Pull up the stakes. Do it. But it's hard to convince a people that the eternal values is the only thing that really counts. The truth taught here is that prolonged and abundant ease. Listen, he says, I want to read, the, the Western church is too comfortable. It says in Jeremiah 40, 11, Moab has been at ease from his youth and is settled on a lease. Now the taught here is that prolonged and abundant ease will destroy. Amen. We just go along and say, no change. Get a new car every other year. Everything is good. No change. It produces a death. It produces a death, no matter how you look. As we go over the role of names of patriarchs, prophets, apostles, saints, above all the Son of God, not one was out. Chastisement of Christ had said the chastisement of our peace was upon him. So in the history of the chosen people, we see how they were moved from vessel to vessel. What changes? Listen. What agitation? What tossing? All the way. And so the history of the church is checkered. God has allowed things to disturb it and wake it up, to bring it back to a place of concentration to Him. We, we brought the wrath upon us by allowing these things that are enemy of God to invade the territory of God. All these illustrations of God's Word showing the determination of God that His people should not suffer the peril of too much ease and become as Moab. We should never. Now, every pastor knows he has two congregations. The dead and the living. Like Gideon, we need to have a revival of subtraction. Somehow or another, there's some things that are never going to believe what we believe, but they're going to hinder what we believe. I know that don't sound very uh, evangelistic, 
but but some of the greatest revivals have been those of subtraction. If Christians were one-tenth excited about the heavenly heritage as they are about the earthly possession, they'd be branded as fanatics. Amy Carmichael wrote this, and I'm coming to a close. Listen, we follow the crucified, we who follow the crucified are not here to make a pleasant thing of life. One of the greatest women maybe that ever lived on this planet challenged single-handedly the government of India and broke the power of child prostitution in that temple. Amen. But here, sir, we're not make life a pleasant thing. We're called to suffer for the sake of a suffering sinful world. The Lord forgive us our shameful evasions and hesitation. His brow was crowned with thorns. Do we seek rosebuds for our crowning? His hands were pierced with nails. Are our hands ringed with jewels? His feet were bare and bound. Do our feet walk delicately? What do we know of travail, of tears that scald before the fall? of heartbreak, of being scorned. God forgive us our love of ease. God forgive us that so often we turn our face from life that is even remotely like His. My God, how true. How true. Rebel because the preacher wants to turn the clock back a little bit. Amen. Forgive us that we all but worship comfort, the delight of presence of loved ones, possessions, earthly treasures on earth. Far, far from our prayers. Too often is any thought of prayer for love which will lead us to give us one whom we love to follow our Lord to Gethsemane, to Calvary. Perhaps because we've never been to Calvary ourselves. From subtle love of softened things, from easy choices, weakening things. Not thus our spirits fortified. And this, this way with the crucified, from all that dims our Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. The love of things robs the church of the passion for souls. Few members take more than casual interest in the salvation of a world that's lost. Very few. Many of us have ceased to be amazed at the difference because there's so much apathy within. A great preacher once said, Every vacant chair in a prayer meeting is a vote against revival. Think about it. The church of God must repent in sackcloth and ashes. It must begin somewhere. The greatest call of every Christian is live abundantly, aggressively, joyfully now in the power of the Holy Ghost. But he'll not go where some of us go. He'll not watch what some of us watch. And God is saying to us today, if he's touched our hearts, it's not a time to put off. It's time to do. One time, too many, those foolish virgins left their church without renewing those vows. There's some in this building this morning that may be true. Let us stand. Father, we're so thankful today for your holy presence. Thank you, oh great God, this morning. I pray you've talked to our hearts that we've come to understand that if we're a friend to a system that hated and crucified you, then the love for you is not in our hearts. We sometimes don't know what that word world means, but I pray somehow, some little door, some crack has been opened today, Lord, that if our lives, if we are more passionate over sports than a prayer meeting in the Word of God, we're worldly people. And the love of the world has robbed us of any love of you. We're individuals here, but we're a collective church. The church is what we individuals are. We can never deal with the thought that we're not important. Because what I bring in is what's in. Please, God, talk to every one of us this morning. As we stand here in thy presence, in the name of Jesus. If there's things in that life, heads are bowed, listen. Things in that life, Christian friend, if you're here this morning and you've never been birthed of God, we want you in this altar this morning. We want to help you. 
I can tell you, church, if we'll let him deal with those particular things in our life, the glory of God will come again. The only thing that keeps that river from flowing is what you are and what I am, the flesh. That's what the fast deals with. Nothing else. Hell didn't stop this. We just give him a door. But if you're here this morning and you've allowed things, you're more passionate about things and some things than you are God, then there needs to be a repentance at this altar this morning. Now I ask you in the name of Jesus, while they make the music and sing, if you feel you need of that this morning, this is a way to start a camp meeting, a renewal of every vow. Come, let us reason together. The altar awaits us here this morning. Hallelujah. Just move out to that aisle and let's before God. You don't have to talk about anybody else. Talk about ourselves. What have I allowed in this life that God will not allow? Oh my God, help us this morning. Come folks, let us reason together. Amen. God, dealing with our hearts, talking with us. To renew that vow this morning. To renew that vow this morning in this altar. Amen. Surely you out there, you have to make an altar there. That's perfectly wonderful. But come down here if you can. Any of you that don't need this, please come help us at noon. We're desperate people before God. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the... You know, I went through the war, and on the island of Peleliu, all of our company was either killed or wounded, but, but 80 of us, out of 1,100 of our battalion, only 80 of us were able to walk back aboard the ship. I believe this is on it, yeah. Uh, uh, only 80 of us were able to walk back aboard the ship, but on that island, while we were fighting there, my friend and I, I had a machine gun section, two machine guns that is, and we had lost down to wasn't a but about four of us out of that squad of 13 left. And a friend of mine called him Yogi. He practiced Yogi all the time. Named Fields from Oregon. One of the best friends. You couldn't dig a hole. It was just like that concrete floor. It was a coral island. And we just stacked rocks up. And he and I was laying down. And the shelling was atrocious. Everywhere. Just men being blown up. And it was just for four hours. We lay in that hole you couldn't breathe. Just hoping to survive. And all of a sudden... All of a sudden, during the midst of this war, he moved one way and I moved another. We both were terribly frightened. And when it was over, he was still shaking. He said to me, how come you moved? And I said, how come you moved? And he said, well, I'll tell you, if I'm not, if I wasn't cracking up under the train of this war, somebody got in that hole with us. Somebody got in that hole. I said, well, I'll tell you, if you're cracking up, I'm cracking up. Because somebody got in that hole. Listen, just as sure as there's a God in heaven, I never knew who it was till 1949 in January. I got saved at an altar in a little Assembly of God church in Alice, Texas. The man preached. I walked in. I'll tell you about more about it in a moment. But the man preached and knelt in that altar. And I said, make the man he talked about real to me. And he walked into my heart. And when he came in, he said, I'm the one that got with you on the Isle of Hallelujah. but few blessings and few manifestations. Mm -hmm. And God says that in the last days, amen, uh, according to, the, to Ezekiel, that the word that he is speaking, he is going to expedite that word. He's going to bring that word to pass. Hallelujah. And uh, we're declaring and decreeing this word over the nations of, of the world, that the nations of the world will be the nations of our Christ. Hallelujah. And, and, and the purpose is to form Christ in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.28 says to present every man perfect in Christ. Now how are we perfected in Christ? First of all, uh, as we experience the presence of God, as God starts to expand our capacity to carry His presence, 
His supernatural, indestructible life is being formed in us. The Bible says Satan has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus has come to give us life and to give it in abundance. Now, I was telling the churches this morning in Central and South America that we have to understand that in the spirit, God is going to open up a window of opportunity. Amen? Amen. Uh, and I was talking about uh, comparing it to the tribe of Issachar. The Bible says that they were very trained in the different weapons, but they also knew what Israel should do, meaning that when we're a prophetic generation, the generation that God is raising up in this hour is a generation that is going to be able to see the future and prepare in the present. That's why we need the prophetic anointing. That's why we need to gather apostles and prophets over all the land. We need to, to gather sons and daughters, amen, that are going to be able to believe God's word in spite of, amen? I want you to say that tonight, in spite of. In spite of. Natural, of. natural circumstance you may be going through. Amen. Let's say something. By the word of the Lord, the darkest hours before the dawn. Amen. 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 And, and the, the, the kingdom of God is 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 so uh, been designed by God to be able to go through turbulent times without changing direction, without changing purpose. The God, the word that God spoke to you three or four years ago before uh, the economy uh, took a decline is closer today than it was back then. God has not changed His mind. Amen? amen. But as sons and daughters of the Lord, we must understand, amen, the opportunities that God gives us, amen, and the timing in the kingdom of God. Now, I want us to go to the book of Esther, chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 11. Esther chapter 4, verse 11. And we know, we see that God is an on-time God. I want you to know Michael Bradford. I want you to know Nancy Burris. I want you to know Jeff, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Jack John in South Africa, Alphonse Betty Holland, Abram in New York, Carlos, uh, Heather and, 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 and Andrew in North Carolina. I think we've got about nine people online with us tonight. Amen. That, that God is going to arrive on time. Amen. And, and, I, and I remember the complaint that Habakkuk, the prophet, had. He says, I will sit on my watch until I, I have an answer, amen? And, and we are those that have that tenacity to, to press into God in this season when everything seems to be breaking loose. All hell is breaking loose. Amen. Around. I have a word from heaven that God is speaking. It's a clear word that God is speaking. And God is getting ready to extend supernatural grace. He's getting ready. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about mega grace. Oh. And mega Amen? Hallelujah. And if you're called and summoned before God, mm. can you stand before Him? Amen? Oh, but we will be those that will be, see God face to face and we will live. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says here in Esther chapter 4, Verse 11, and of course, this was a time of crisis. God's word always is applicable in times of crisis. In fact, that's when God mostly speaks. Amen? Mm -hmm. So whatever situation, whether it be financial, whether it be family, whether it be emotional, whether it be uh, with your physical body, whatever situation, amen, that you're going through right now, God has the answer. Amen. Amen. And we see here in verse 11. And all the king's servants of the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, uh, whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to be put him to death, except such Amen? To whom the king shall hold out his golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come unto kings these 30 days. Amen? Amen. And, and told uh, Mordecai 
Esther's world. Esther was being prepared. If, if, we, if, we, if we read further back, which we don't have time to do, she went through a preparation of six months she she with, with oils like frankincense uh-huh. and, and cassia. And, and these uh, anointings, these oils that was, uh, she was being anointed with, was being was 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 preparing her to, to come uh, face to face with the king. Amen. Hallelujah. And we turn in verse twelve. And they told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Amen. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Amen. So, let me tell you something by the word of the Lord. God is opening up opportunities in the spirit <laughs> where we have to make decisions, amen? Mm-hmm. Where we have to press in, amen? And, and let me tell you something. Esther came to a point in her life where if we read on a little bit further, she was willing to die for what she had been prepared for. Amen. For what she, had, what she had believed God for. Hallelujah. And the Bible says she entered into prayer and fasting. Hallelujah. And 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 as she prayed and fasted, and, and God had brought her through a preparation. You know, we're being prepared, where God is forming His supernatural life, the life of Christ in us. See, the message of the kingdom is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah! And as we're being prepared to come before the King, we, we, we Esther put it all on the line. Amen. And let me tell you, the word of the Lord now today is. So it all now. I'm not talking about just your pocket. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your passion. I'm talking about everything that God foreknew you in, in your mother's womb. For such time as this, God has brought you to the kingdom. Hallelujah. You've been being passionate born. Hallelujah. And the spirit of adoption has come. The spirit of Christ that calls out the Father. God is forming his life, and there's uh, circumstances around you right now that are difficult circumstances, just like in the time of Esther. Amen? The Jews were looking on being exterminated yeah, by that Antichrist and kingdom spirit, just like today, if you've taken a stand for the kingdom of God, the Bible says the kingdom of God suffered violence, and only the violence taken by force. But let me tell you something. The only thing that cannot stop coming to you in this hour and in this season is the word of the Lord. And there's a clear word from heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. For a summon with face to face with the king. Hallelujah. And when the time came, let me tell you something. As you entered into the intercourse, you've been talking about the message of the kingdom, the message of Zion. And Zion is the place where we meet God face to face. It's the inner dimension of God. Mm. On the outside anymore, trying to get in. We're on the inside. Hallelujah. The Bible says that Zion is a place where there's periods of angels. The Bible says that in Zion that there's a blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel, which is the blood of Jesus. The Zion in Zion, the Bible says that there's the judge of just spirit being perfect. Made perfect. And the life of Christ is being perfected in you. That's why the, the difficulty you've been coming, you've been, it seems like you've been coming through a desert. It seems like the last year or two years have been the difficultest ones, hallelujah, in your life. But let me tell you something. Get ready. Get ready for the suddenly said the Spirit of Amen. God. Amen. Natural deliverance is coming. <laughs> if we can only stand and believe and know, hallelujah, that as Christ's life is seen in us, there's a new day prophetically that's coming to the sons of God. Hallelujah. And, and hallelujah. And the king is going to extend his scepter. Amen. We you know as Esther entered into the intercourt, hallelujah, and the king saw Esther. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Scepter. His scepter. Mm-hmm. And uh, the scepter was extended. Hallelujah. And, and grace. Amen. To Esther. Mm-hmm. The scepter of the king is extended to you tonight. And I was telling the churches in Central and South America, Esther didn't ask instantly for the deliverance of her people. She asked to make a banquet. Amen? And, and, and my mind goes back to the Psalm 23 where, where every time that there's conflict, the Bible says that God prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Because we are covenant sons and daughters of the Lord. Hallelujah. And God is preparing a supernatural deliverance. Let me tell you something. The deliverance that God is preparing for you is greater than you can imagine. The Bible says that eye has not seen and ear has not heard. And mind has not conceived the things that God has got prepared for those that love him. Amen. Wow. So those that love him are those that believe in his word. Amen. Amen. And you know, it's not a time to be idle. Amen. Our most precious commodity mm-hmm. is our time. Amen. And we have to pursue the relationships that deliver. Amen. In the kingdom of God. That's why God raises up fathers and he raises up sons. Amen. And, and, you, and you later on will be fathers and mothers in the Lord. And some of you already are. Hallelujah. But God is raising up a mighty people of God. Amen. He's raising up a new generation. So many of you are coming out of the old and transitioning into the new. You're coming out of religion and transitioning into the kingdom. But the Bible says that God pours in the new wine into new wine skins. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It, it has to form that wine skin. That old religious wine skin, God, it has to break that away. But God is forming a new wine skin. Amen. So that he can pour in new wine. Now, Pastor Sonia wants to share something about the manifestation. Amen. And I want you to remember that word prophetically. Okay. Manifestation. It's no longer time for promises and time for promised blessings. Now, this is a time in God where we need to see the manifestation of what God has been speaking. Hallelujah. Because God is a man. He's not like a man. God is, is one that will not lie. He's sworn by his word and by his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we've got to stand and believe the word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, speaking about a uh, supernatural deliverance, uh, we see here in this uh, uh, the Bible, the uh, Bible, uh, uh, chapter 20, and where um, uh, Jehoshaphat uh, feared the the report of the enemy, you know, and it was a greater enemy than him. Uh, it sometimes feel that we are coming against, so we're facing a, an enemy that is greater than us, but the word of God says, greater is the one in us, but the one in the world, right? Right. And, and, and but he had the right attitude. He knew that uh, uh, there was, was a great enemy, but he did the correct thing. He came, uh, uh, in verse 3, he says that he feared. And sometimes we fear, or we hurt, or, or or we cry out to the Lord and of the things that we hear and that we feel and that we're going through. But he feared, but he, he set himself to seek the Lord. And that's the difference. Uh, doesn't matter what, we need to set ourselves. The Word of God says that, Matthew 6, 33, to seek the kingdom of God first, right? And it's righteousness. Because the rest, it will be added unto us. That means it's already done. It's just that. Uh, we need to go through through a process first, seek the Lord. So we seek the Lord in this case here, first of all, even though he feared the report and, and the great enemy uh, uh, that, that, that he was going to uh, 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 confront, but he humbled himself. And then uh, verse 4 says that they gathered together, and we I put the name of the ministry and our names there, and I said that all nations destiny gathered themselves together, amen. All of us here to a sky, we are gathering ourselves, different nations, and the components of this nation are gathering together uh, 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 and to ask of the Lord, hallelujah, and even out of all the cities, of this nation and the nations of the world, they came to seek the Lord. And I'm just putting that there in the Word of God. And, and then verse 5 says, 
Porque vamos chamar estudo da congregação e na ser Angel e Sonia Gutierrez, believe in the Lord, we stood in the congregation in Miami and the nations of the world. You can put the name in your nation there in the house of the Lord before the new court and say, Oh Lord, God of our Father, we start crying out, Amen. Start crying out. And he said, uh, 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 and in thy hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to stand thee. The, he has the, the strength and the power. Nobody can stand against the Lord. And then, and our church has come up God. God up the inhabitants of this land, the people of Israel, and there is a state that stands forever, and they should dwell therein. They have built the and and started uh, the ring for the name saying, if they need to come out of the poor judgment or pestilence or famine we stand before this house and in your presence amen because your name is in this house and according to, to you in your affliction and then you will feel us, amen and that's that super and, and, and I, we were praying and I really had and usually it's, it's the, the normal for me to get mad at the enemy. Mad at the enemy when we put a stop to the works of the enemy in the nations, in the families, in the church, in our lives, in, in the finances, in the business arena, in every area. We put a stop to the enemy. No more the enemy is going to take control of the time. And God will redeem the time. God will deliver us uh, from anything supernaturally because what we need God to do, uh, what, what we need in our life, only God can do it for us. Nobody else. Not the economy. Not the government. Nobody else. Amen. Not the relative. But only God can do it for us. And verse 12 says, All our gods with, uh, uh, do not judge them, for we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we have to do but our eyes are upon thee. Hallelujah. And it says that the prophetic anointing later on says it came uh, 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 over prophet Zacharias and start the Lord of uh, 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 and, and, and say, Hearken, you Judah, and you inheritance of the nation. And the king, Joshua, who says the Lord unto you, what he says, do not be afraid, nor dismay, but this by reason of this great multiple for the battles of yours, but God. Verse says, tomorrow, hallelujah, God, eh, eh, tonight is the beginning of the receiving the benefit of this victory. The Lord is fighting for you. Why do you battle? Uh, everything okay. starts, finishes with God. The moment that we decree in the end, word of the Lord, the word of your deliverance, the word of the favor and grace of God that God is releasing over your life in this new season. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord for you to come out of being battle weary. Hallelujah. Amen. In some battle weary. Let me tell you, this is going to be a time of refresh. This is going to be natural deliverance and healing. This is going to be a time that God is going to release Hallelujah, the spirit of miracles, hallelujah, in, in our midst. God is going to start to, to break out in, in, in our ministries, hallelujah. God is going to start to open the heavens. And we know that, so that naturally right now, amen, the first thing that happens in the natural when judgment is coming over a nation is that rain stops, amen. And we see that the rain has stopped. In, in, I was looking uh, today at the weather report. 46% nation is in drought. Amen. And I know some of you, like Michael Bradford, some of you uh, in your areas have not received rain for the last two weeks. Open up the heavens. God is trying to open up the heavens like he did in the time of, of the prophets. Hallelujah. And by the word of the Lord, God is going to make it rain. Hallelujah. Because let me tell you something. The first word that God is speaking to us in the midst of judgment is not to fear. I was telling you that today. That, amen? When we are in judgment, when, when judgment comes, amen, God sets a stand. And the third hallelujah, God judges the earth. And when, when we are aligned, 
uh, a judgment. We will be preserved of all judgment. I want you to know that God is getting ready to bring a supernatural deliverance. God is getting ready to 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 preserve you in the midst of judgment. God is getting ready to break out in your in your region. We prophesy over the different regions. Amen. We prophesy over the zoo, over the Midwest. This thing, this have a drought. Hallelujah. We declare in the creator of the heavens that rain is coming forth in the natural. Amen. For Springfield, Virginia. Hallelujah. Over the origin of a Pastor Jeff there. In the name of Jesus. And we declare in the creed. Hallelujah. The God is bringing judgment. Hallelujah. Over the spirit of religion. Hallelujah. Over the end of my spirit. In that region, we find the strong man. We declare in decree that God is breaking out of your region, Pastor. Hallelujah. That there's a miracles. Hallelujah. That's getting ready to break out of the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We declare a supernatural increase over the ministry for God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Father, right now, we declare and we decree over you, uh, Prophet is Betty. Hallelujah. In your region where there's been storms and there's been different things in the atmosphere, we declare and decree, hallelujah, by the word of the Lord, that God is speaking a word, hallelujah, in season, that God is going to manifest in this season, in your life, in your ministry, in your finances, in your health, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, Father, we declare and decree right now, life for that region, Father, in yes, Jesus. hallelujah, to Ohio region, to Missouri, Father, to Virginia, Father, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, we prophesy, Father, over the nations, Lord God, over, over the, the, hallelujah, the states of this nation, of the United States, Father God, hallelujah, and we declare and decree that there is a preserving aspect of the prophetic word over this nation, Father, we declare and decree that the sons of God, that the remnant of God will be preserved, Lord God, that a thousand will fall by thy right, and ten thousand by thy left, that no plague will come behind thy dwelling. Yes! We take our stand in our position in heaven places with Christ, and we declare, Father, over every power and over every principality, Father, that has withstood the, the word of the Lord, that has withstood, hallelujah, the will of the Lord, Father, every spirit of delay, every obstacle, hallelujah, that has stood in the way of the sons of God, we declare and decree, even as Joshua prophesied and spoke, hallelujah, to the walls as they shouted, and the walls fell, Father, yes. we declare that you're sending forth the spirit of the breaker right now. Yes! That you send the spirit of the breaker That you're going to break out, Lord God. Father, we declare Isaiah 10, 28, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit breaks every yoke of bondage, Lord God. Yes! For this reason, would the Son of God manifest. So the enemy, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Father, I declare and decree that you're increasing. Okay, where you're at, I want you to lift up your hands right now. In the name of Jesus. Yes. Amen. It's falling on you right now. God, hallelujah, is giving you an impartation right now. In the name of Jesus. Right where you're at. I want you to believe. I want you to stand. Because I said, I, I, I perceive of the Lord that there's an anointing. Hallelujah. For victory. So yes. God is releasing right now. There's an anointing for breakthrough. Yes. So right now. I in receive it. Yes. I receive my miracle. God is with me right now. Hallelujah. 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 Father, I bind territorial spirits, God. Yes. We bind every strong man over every region in the name of Jesus. And we declare and decree, hallelujah, hallelujah, that a stronger man, hallelujah. Yes! Hallelujah, Jesus, Lord God. We declare and decree that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And Father, we declare liberty. It's not by power. It's not by might like oh, yes, said. By your it's spirit. by the Spirit, says the Lord. And so I declare and decree a fresh impartation, a fresh infusion of life. Lord yes! God. The Christ is the Spirit of life, Lord God. Father, let the anointing of God right now flow. Hallelujah. Let it touch their bodies. Let it touch their mind, Lord God. Yes! Yeah. 
of knowledge, Lord God, the wisdom, Lord God, the fear, the, uh, the fear of the Lord, hallelujah, the forgiven spirits, Lord God, from your throne right now, Father God, hallelujah, let them, hallelujah, be imparted, Father, in yes. your sons and daughters in the Lord, hallelujah. Yes. Father God, Father, and we've come to a time when we've come to a season in this world, Lord God, where they're calling evil good and good evil, Father God. Father, but let your word prevail. We declare and decree your word over this nation, over this nation, from the north, south, east, and the west, Lord God. Father, every strategical point of this nation, we declare and decree that Jehovah Nisi, the family of our God, hallelujah, Jehovah Nisi, Father, is the yes. He declare victory. He declare great truth in Jesus' name. Oh, God. Did you say Providence Betty? Yes, okay, Father God, in the name of Jesus, the name that is named above every name that's named, El Elyon, who is the Most High God. Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I come against the words of all of the false prophets that are speaking over this nation right now. Lord God, all of the ones that are speaking doom and gloom and speaking judgment, Lord God, over this nation in Jesus' mighty name. Releasing words, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And Father, your word says, Whoa, I am against them in Jesus' mighty name. I am against the soothsayers and the diviners, says the Lord. Father, we loose this nation and our cities from the false words, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And we release, Lord God, the truth, pure infallible word of God Lord God we release the true prophetic voices in Jesus mighty name and Father God all these people that are calling themselves prophets Lord God and they're speaking this nonsense Lord God I ask Father that you deal with them directly Lord God one on one and Lord God you said you would chasten them Lord God and if they would not receive the chastening of, of the Lord Father, that they're a bastard son. In Jesus' mighty name. And Father, we release the glory of the Lord in this nation, Lord God. We release the fire of God in this nation, Father God. We release the revelation of glory uh, in this nation, Lord God. The mystery, Father God. Father, that Christ in us is the hope of glory, Lord God. Father, let us be carriers of your glory. Let us become portable arcs, Lord God. And everywhere we go, Lord God, let us begin to release the glory. Father God, in our regions, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we release peace, Lord, into the atmosphere over the turmoil of the nations, Lord God, right now in Jesus' mighty name. And Father, you said, speak to the heavens and command them to be thou open. Lord God, we speak to the heavens over all of the regions, Lord God that are represented here tonight, Lord God. Father, if they need rain, we're asking, Lord God, that you release rain. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we break the curse of drought. Yes, Lord God, peace. over our nation, Father God, in it's Jesus' no. mighty name. And we command the heavens to begin to open it's up free. and free. release the rain, natural rain, physical yes, rain, spiritual peace. rain. Yes, in Jesus' mighty name. And Lord, areas where they're having flooding, Lord God, and excessive rain. In Jesus' name, Lord, we speak to those areas. In Jesus' name, and we ask, Father, for a little bit that you would close the heavens up and begin to give them some release. Lord God, so the water can begin to dissipate. In Jesus' name, and Lord, the mudslides and everything that's going on, Father, in this age. And in, in their particular regions, Lord God. And for the, I'm asking, Lord God, 
that the clear, true, pure word that's being released, Lord God, about the remnant, and Lord, how you will preserve the remnant. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged as the world would judge. In Jesus' mighty name, and that you will preserve us and protect us, Lord God. And let us, the remnant bride, come together, Father God, in unity, Father God, as one man, as one army, going forth, Lord God, in Jesus' name, to begin to bring down the, the cause the kingdoms of this world to begin to bow and bend to the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Father, for each one of us that's on this line tonight. Lord, that Christ is being formed in each one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, and we give you praise for it, Lord God. Bring us all through the transition stage, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name, and we praise you, Lord. And we give you honor, and we give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, and amen, and amen. Amen. Pastor Jeff, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you, God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to just come and bow before you, God, and just come to your throne of grace, God. Father, I just just, just lift up the name of Jesus right now, God. Father, we exalt you right now, God. And Father God, the word that I just keep hearing in my spirit is righteousness and raising up the standard of righteousness, God. Yes. It's in Proverbs 14.34 that uh, righteousness will exalt a nation. Yes. Uh, so Father, just right now, God, just I just I just declare and decree righteousness will be the standard, God. Father, yes. righteousness uh, just standing on your word, God. Yes. Look to the right of what false prophets may say, but we just stand on your word, God. Father, we just stand on your word in this nation, God. Have your way, Lord. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, God. And Father, let's make a second part of this. We repent right now, God. Yes, we Lord. That you would forgive us, God. Yes, Lord. Known and unknown, God. Yes. Have mercy, God. Have mercy, Lord. Father, we so oppression, Lord God. Wait from hate, from criticism, for anything. Yes, idolatry, but, Lord God. Yes, idolatry, God. In Paul, Jesus' God. name. Oh, Sins of Lord. omission and commission. You, God, we ask that you forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, God. Yes, Lord. And bring this nation back to a right standing. Yes, with you, God. if, you if my people. Us. Bless God. Yes, Lord. You bless us and make us a great nation, God. So we stand on your word right now, God, for all the reasons, God. Father, we thank you for your release. We thank you for the word that came from your manifestation, God. Father, I thank you for your confirmation. I was just praying, God. And Father, we thank you for your activation. We thank you for the demonstration. Yes, Lord. God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Go ahead and pray to the Thank you, Father. Thank you, for, Father, that for such a time as this, you have called all nations, destiny, church, and all the sons and daughters that are joined here tonight, Father, and that we have found favor in your eyes, Father, and you've extended that scepter unto us, Father. And, yeah. Father, as we sit and have supper with you in this banquet, Father God, we thank you, Father, that you are the God, Father, that hears us, Father. And, Father, we do praise you. We honor you. We exalt you. We thank you for that finished work at the cross, Father. And Father, we just know that for such a time as this, you've prepared us, Father, that we are dressed with those robes of righteousness represents you, Father God. And Father, that we will not tolerate any other standard but your standard, Father, yes. and your stature, Father. Right. We thank you, Father, that your word has come out of your throne, Father, through the apostle tonight, Father. And Father, this is a time of manifestation of miracles, Father. Thank yes! You, and the miracles and the signs and the and wonders, I'm gonna Father. Get one. Thank you, Father. We are positioned correctly to receive, Father, and so that we would I'm give the honor back to you, Father God, you that you trusted us with, Father, and that we will do your will, Father, not our will be done, but your will be done, Father. Yeah. We thank you for that spirit of wisdom, Father. Yes. To know the signs of the time and the discernment, Father. And that we will have zero tolerance to the enemy, Father. That yes. we will call those things as though they are. 
And when the sin is in the land, Father, we call it a sin, Father. And we curse that root of sin. We curse that root of idolatry. We curse the root of jealousy. We curse the spirit of rebellion. We curse the spirit of witchcraft. We curse the spirit of Ahab and Jezebel. Yes. We curse this will come and death and destruction upon their house. And we thank you, Father, that for such a time as this, that we are in our rightful place, that destruction will not come to our home, Father. This house that we're building for you, Lord God, thank you, Father, that you're well pleased. Thank you, Father, that you have found us obedient, Father. And great is the reward for the house and the workers and the laborers, Father. Thank you, Father, that there's not a spirit of slothfulness or laziness, Father, that that we will be diligent, Father, to doing what you called us to do. We thank you, Father, that we haven't hidden our talents, Father, but that we set our our talents forth, Father, to be multiplied, Father, Mm -hmm. and to bring in the harvest, Father, that you desire, Father. We thank you, Father, for that spirit of compassion, Father, and that spirit of wisdom and love, Father God, and to receive, Father God, not in offense, Father, but to receive the correction that we need to be corrected or adjusted, Father. And thank you, Lord God, that we know that we know that we know that you've heard us tonight. We honor you and bless you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Susan, are you there? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Father God, that your mercy and your grace is being extended to every region, Father God. Father, the word that we have spoken in season, that this is a season where your where our, your sons are being prepared, Father, for an audience with the King, Lord God. Father, yes. but we declare and decree that the, 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 the seal of authenticity is the life of Christ that's being formed in us. Father, we declare and decree, Father, that you, your scepter, is a favor of grace is being extended to every one of, of your sons and daughters in this season, Lord God. Hallelujah, Father, we declare and decree for supernatural breakthrough right now. Yes! Father, hallelujah, we declare and decree that we stand fast on your word. Father God, that you're preparing a table in the presence of our enemies, Lord God. Mm-hmm. Father, that there's a great, great uh, uh, banquet that you're preparing, Lord God. Yes! Father, declare and decree that there's a new prophetic season, Father. Yes! That we're entering in, Father. A season of refreshing, Father God. Father, we're too many of us are battle-weary, Father, but we declare and decree in the name of Jesus right now. Father, over every region, Father. Father, over Miami, Father God. Over yes. North Carolina, over Virginia, over Missouri, over Ohio, Lord God. Over New York, Father God. We declare and decree, Father, supernatural deliverance and breakthrough. In yes, Jesus. yes, 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 yes. Michael, are you there? Mike? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, right now. Father, we thank you right now, and we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Carlos, are you there? In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray for everyone, every intercessor, Lord God, uh, we pray for the Ohio region, we pray for Virginia, we pray for New York, Lord God, Father, the capital of this nation, Father God. We declare and decree that you're preserving this nation of the United States of America, Lord. And Father, we declare and decree that your provision, Father, when we do your will, your provision comes, Father. I declare and decree abundance provision for every, yes. Lord God. Father, that what's being withheld, every spirit of delay, every yes. spirit of withheld, Father, we declare supernatural breakthrough in the name of Jesus, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name. Yes. You haven't heard from Julie. Is she there? Yes, she's here. I'm here. Okay. I don't know know what happened to Carlo. He didn't show up, but I've got somebody on the phone that I'd like for you to meet. His name is Carl Sullivan, and he's kind of like my spiritual papa. And he's from Zanesville, Ohio. Mm-hmm. And he's 89 years young. Oh, okay. Carl? Hello? Hey, hey, Carl? Yeah. Are you there? I'm there. Say hello to Apostle Angel. Okay. He's on. Hey, Carl. The- hey, 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 Carl. How are you? God bless you. Thank Amen. you. Thank you. Betty, Betty made me a year and a half older. I, I okay. have to teach her. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> How old are you, Carl? Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. <laughs> Lord Jesus. You declare and decree a long life as you serve the Lord, uh, brother. Yes. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Uh, God bless each and every one of you in in, a, in every region. I just, you know, um, I've sensed that there's a lot of opposition tonight as we're, uh, we share the word of the Lord with you guys. Uh, and I just encourage you to continue to press in, to continue to believe God, uh, to continue to stay built up in, in your, in your faith. Amen. Just praying in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy, in the Holy Ghost. But as you continue to pray and press in in this season, amen, what you've been believing God for is going to manifest. Amen. Amen. And, and I believe that, that by our next, uh, transmission together on Skype, we're going to hear some testimonies. And, and today I heard a, a very nice testimony um, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a sister we had been praying for, and she had a business. And, and uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, um, she uh, got into some, some legal problems and, and uh, uh, was needing an attorney and was needing all kinds of things. Uh, very Today, this morning, when I woke up and she was on my mind and I, we prayed, and, and um, she had recommended a few people to this attorney, and this attorney is going to represent her uh, for what she felt was going to be thousands of dollars, totally free. And he's saying that, uh, wow. that not to worry, that God is going to, that, that, she, that he's going to be able to, to really help her. And that's how God is going to step up for each and every one of you guys, amen? Hallelujah. Uh, uh, for supernatural deliverance, supernatural healing and miracles, uh, and, and God is get, is releasing all those things to you guys in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I just wanted to close in prayer now. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Father, we thank you for the word that you've been see, speaking, Lord. And we remember that this is a season of opportunity, Lord. You're opening a door. Your word says that you open a door that no man can shut. Amen. So, Lord, I pray that you would open those doors, Father. And, and your word says that you make a way where there is no way, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, I just declare and decree those ways that, that you're opening up those doors and those 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 paths that you're opening up in the spirit, Lord God. And Father, we're going to find them by faith, by believing your word and continuing to go forward, Lord God. Father, I declare and decree, Lord God, that uh, that your provision, Father, will follow uh, your uh, the purpose of God in our life, Lord God. And Father, I, I pray that you would bless us. Uh, uh, every person that's listening tonight, I declare healing over their physical bodies. I declare deliverance uh, uh, and blessings to them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Apostle. Yes. Uh, can I share a, a, a little testimony today that just blessed my heart? Okay, go ahead. We, we've been praying for uh, a little gal out in um, uh, Delaware. Her name is Sabrina for about a year and a half now. Bronx, New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pardon me, the Bronx, New York. And okay. anyhow, she had lost custody of her son through a bunch, a series of things really that weren't her fault. Mm -hmm. And um, anyhow, her son's name is Joshua John. Mm -hmm. And she lost him when he was four weeks old. Well, he's he's now almost two. And she started calling us about a year and a half ago and, mm -hmm. and telling us the story uh, about everything that's happened to her and how she was going through depression and, and everything. And I've been on the phone with her so many times, it's not funny, and just started sharing the word with her and started teaching her to, how to declare and decree. And I walked her through a lot of things. And so anyway, we finally got it to the point to where she was going to go to court and uh, they was going to uh, see about turning the child back over to her. And so her hearing was today. Well, mm -hmm. she called last night, and the enemy was pouncing all over her, and she was experiencing fear and all this kind of stuff, and I just took authority. And we started praying, <clears throat> and I started declaring and decreeing, no, we're not going to believe the evil report. We're going to believe the report of the Lord, and that child is coming back to its mother. In Jesus' name. And then I said, Julie, go get me my judge's gavel. And I said, we're going to clack that gavel seven times. 
and we're going to declare and decree each time we clap the gavel. And I said, because we're executing um, the Word of God in the earth, which already been done in heaven. And so every time we clap that, that gavel, we said, Sabrina's son is being returned to her, or whatever the Spirit would inspire us to say. And I'm telling you what, on that seventh time, boy, I'll tell you, I felt such a release. And I said, Sabrina, it's as good as done. That son is coming home. And then I said, okay, we're going to clock it one more time for new beginnings. And we hit that thing again. And she went, "Woo! hallelujah, I felt that. And so today when she went to court, and, and I prayed a prayer, and I said, Lord, I don't care. What those people think or say, if they want to try to say something negative, I ask you, Lord, to cause their mouth to just be shut by the power of the living God, and they can't say anything but what you want to happen with that little boy. And she said it was so funny, she said, because they would start to open their mouth and say something, and all of a sudden they just like choked on their words. Mm. And so when the judge came up to render the verdict, and he said, Sabrina, your son is coming home. We release him now. Amen. Amen. So she called and was ecstatic. Mm. And then on top of that, guess what else has happened for her? God is restoring her marriage. Her and her husband are starting to come back together. Amen. We've been praying for that. I told her, I said, you're going to see restoration of the whole family. She said, I know it, Betty. I can't believe all this is happening. I said, because we're in a time of, of manifestation. That's right. That's right. So what a victory. Hallelujah. We were just praising the Lord. And I declare that word of manifestation, that Brother Michael Bradford, I declare that God is going to arrive to you on time, brother. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And Jeff, Amen. Yes, sir. You continue, brother, to press in to God, and I and I really believe that uh, that God is, is 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 opening a new season for you, uh, Pastor. Uh, and I and I really perceive to tell you from the Lord that it's going to be a season of you and God. Uh, it's going to be a season where you're going to go be drawn into your closet a lot with the Lord, but you're going to receive a lot of revelation from God. Amen. In this season, Amen. And that God is really going to guide you and direct you. You've had a lot of questions in your heart, and God is going to answer every one of them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, I don't know uh, what happened tonight on Skype. I think uh, there's a few problems because uh, I, I don't hear some of you online anymore. But um, anyways, uh, well, wherever was... this word went, I know that it, it, it's it's not come back empty. Amen. Who's still, on, who's still online with it? I know Jeff, Betty, uh, um I'm he's here. still online. Yeah, I, I got a text yeah. from Carlos that he got kicked out, and he's been trying to get back on, but he couldn't. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I, saw, I saw. Yes, I'm here, sir. Uh, Michael okay. Brad, Bradford. I saw a note. <laughs> he was on the call. Oh, okay. Because we've got more people than we usually have uh, online. We've had about nine. Um, brother, how are you doing in New York? Uh, guy was that speaking to you? Oh, um, I'm doing really good. Uh, <clears throat> you know, lately. Uh, you guys just been speaking me out, speaking to me out of um, you know magnifying the Lord and and what does that really mean and and led me even through the the Lord's prayer uh, you know and just understanding a full revelation of what uh, Jesus you know was showing as a archetype of you know how we ought to approach prayer in the you know phrase where he says you know um, how would be thy name. You know, just show, that name is separate it's totally distinct totally separate from everything else and so it doesn't matter what authority there is in the earth whatever name there is in the earth whether it's the name of a of a kingdom of a government of a person um, or a disease a, a, an affliction um, that his name is greater than all names and that, to really press into that and understand that he's really the one who is uh, has all authority and all power and that we have this step of approval and we utilize this name in every circumstance in every situation that we have authority over every principality so uh, amen that's the that other thing that's been putting on my heart amen well we declare and decree those breakthroughs in your regions and, and uh, 
Uh, I'm going to I'm going to text you. I had said previously that uh, I would like to go to a second time online, and we'll see if this week uh, we have time to do that. Um, you know, I'm thinking it may be on Friday, uh, but I'm going to see that tomorrow. I'll know more a little bit more about my schedule, but just be looking for those texts out there, you guys, and let me know if we can get together again and, and, and pray. I really believe that the times uh, really uh, um, uh, the times that we're living right now, it, it, we, we need to, to to come together more than once a week. Uh, uh, even if it's just uh, very brief, if we can just come together online to pray and believe God um, and for the breakthroughs, we want to hear uh, those testimonies as they come. It's important that you guys uh, just, uh, and I know, I, I, you know, if they come, I know when they come, uh, that you guys just uh, be very verbal with uh what God is doing, and it's going to help uh, strengthen the faith of, of others that are waiting in their regions for the manifestation of, of God's Word. But, I mean, I really believe that God is summoning us, and He's extending the scepter, and for such a time as this, God has called us into His kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. We bless you tonight from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, and I will be back in touch with you in the next day or so uh, by text, okay? God bless. God bless. God bless. Pastor. Yeah? Uh-huh. We love you.